tonight we are going to listen to a message. It's a message on cassette. I want us to listen on purpose. Uh, sometimes when you listen to what we preach on holiness, sanctification, or related subjects, you might have the idea that we are alone and we appear to be very firm and very strict because of our conviction that the word of God, the scriptures, cannot be broken and that God will not lower the standard for anyone and for any nation, for any generation, for any group of people that where God stood thousands of years before, God is still standing on that same truth. That's why we have the conviction and we stand firm on that conviction. But even though we all believe it, I hope, uh, there are many people that may feel that we are standing alone. So that's why once in a while, I make you to listen to what others teach on this same subject, on similar subjects, so that you encourage your heart to know that if you are standing, you keep on standing because others emphasize the same thing also we'll bow our heads in prayer and then after the prayer we'll have the message on kiss it our father we thank you very much tonight we bless your name because you still have witnesses on earth witnessing to the fact that you are god you change not and that jesus christ is the same yesterday today and forever and that the word of God remains ever the same, unchanging, unchangeable. We're praying as we listen to the message of the word of God tonight from somebody that many of us will not know. And yet, for the clarity of the word, there will be a witness in our spirit that we're still speaking to your church today. We pray, Lord, that you revive the conviction of this biblical divine scriptural unchanging message in the heart of everyone tonight in jesus name and when it comes to our turn to preach such messages will be clear will be definite will be direct i will not compromise in any way we we'll pray lord that you help us in your power in your strength now come what me whatever may be happening will stand on this word of God and equip your people to get ready for the rapture and get ready to meet the Lord. Help us, Lord, to understand everything that we hear today. In Jesus' name, we pray. The following message, What is Holiness, was preached at the Free Gospel Bible Institute in 1982 at their Great Holiness Convention. This is the message that many people said to me, you need to write a book about this tape and this message. And so that was the beginning of the book entitled, What is Holiness? Listen now as we go into a service at the Free Gospel Bible Institute. Please, to the book of Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to be reading a lot of New Testament scripture this morning. And uh, I suppose I've chosen a rather unusual subject for a holiness convention. I want to preach about holiness. And uh, for whoever types the titles on the tapes, just call it, What is Holiness? Have you ever had anybody try to tell you what holiness is it's kind of interesting because we're hearing so many voices nowadays what is holiness what is righteousness what does it really mean what's it all about Amen. let's look at some of these scriptures here in hebrews chapter 12 and and before i get started let me say that uh, the trio that just sang and the trio that sang last night both of these were at our church just a few weeks ago and uh, we really appreciate this school and y'all may not know this, but you were such a blessing to our church when you were there. We were there about five days, I think. And uh, it really blessed our people, really touched them. And they're still praising God for the ministry that the export students and Brother Dutka had at our church. And we really appreciate it. 
Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 12, says, Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Notice verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, I want you to notice several things as we're reading scriptures to you this morning. I think holiness has to be important because we cannot see God without holiness. And that Greek word there, and I'm not a Greek scholar. Somebody said, do you know a little Greek? And I said, I know two of them. They run a restaurant in Independence, and they have good pizza. But the Greek word, optomahi, from which this word is translated see, means to gaze with wide open eyes as at something remarkable. See, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And it means to gaze with your eyes wide open at something remarkable, fully comprehending, and thus it differs from a word that could be used that means just a casual glance. And then he goes on to say this, looking diligently. And I want you to notice this morning that as we talk about holiness or as we talk about righteousness or some of these things, you're going to see words like striving and diligence and uh, laboring and uh, making an effort. I want you to know this morning that if you're going to live a holy life, it's going to take something. You're going to have to work at it. Now, don't confuse this with salvation. The Bible says we're saved by grace through faith. And it's not by works. We're not saved by works. You cannot make yourself good enough to be saved. And so many people go off on a tangent here and fully are unable to discern between the difference that what happens to you after you're saved. So I'm not trying to say that, that uh, you have to be good enough to be saved. But after you are saved, I say without any hesitation, it takes an effort to stay saved. It takes an effort to live the kind of life that God wants you to live. Looking diligently, lest any man fail. All right, we're saved by grace, is that right? But he says, after you're saved, you look diligently lest you fail or fall from that grace of God. What is holiness? What does it mean? What is righteousness? We hear so many voices today, and I've heard this probably a thousand times, Brother Hill, Holiness is of the heart. I don't have any quarrel with that if, if, if people go on and explain the rest of it. Holiness, have you heard it? Holiness is on the inside. Well, I, I think that's great. We've got to be holy on the inside. But brother, let's don't stop there because God doesn't stop there. And we have to realize that if we take the whole context of Scripture, it makes it abundantly clear to us that believing without doing will never get the job done. I hear people say, well, when we were saved, righteousness was imputed to us. We now have on the holiness of Christ. I'm not even going to argue with that. If we'll take it and pursue it and stay in the context of all of God's Scripture that He gives us. And when we stay in that context, my friend, we are made to realize that there is something that we must do to be holy. Can you say amen to that? Right. I've not, I'm not alienated you yet, have I? No. All right. There's something that we're going to have to do. Uh, I've had people say, well, you know, I'm saved and that's as good as I'll ever be. And uh, I, I would like to use the, the expression of the little baby. Uh, we had a little baby boy just about uh, three years ago. And the doctor comes out and he says, he's perfect. And, and he was. But all he did was wet his pants and scream and throw up. He's perfect. The nerve. He's perfect. 
But you know and I know that he does not stay perfect unless he grows. After a while, he began to sit up. After a while, he began to say, Dada. <laughs> After a while, he began to crawl. <laughs> After a while, he began to walk. Now he's talking about, he talked to me on the telephone last night. He says, Daddy, when we get home, we're going to buy a pickup truck, aren't we? He's just three years old. He wants a pickup truck already. I tell you, that kid is growing. But you see, after three years, if all he does is wet his pants and throw up and scream, he's not perfect anymore. And the same thing when we become a newborn baby, when we are a new child in Christ Jesus, we do take upon the, the nature of Christ. But we take upon ourselves that nature of Christ so that we can grow and so that we can praise God with our lives and with our works. All right. Let me give you an illustration. Turn with me to John chapter 14. And here is a scripture that uh, I, I just tremble because so many people use the first part of this passage of scripture to, at, at funerals for people that are not even saved and try to give people a hope of mansions in heaven that are not, that are not even saved. But I want you to see what Jesus said here. John's gospel chapter 14 verse 15. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's amazing, isn't it? If you love me, I want you to do what I say. In another place, Jesus said, You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. What a basis for friendship. And, and yet, you pastors know that if you try to preach a little bit of holiness and a little bit of standards, people say, He's a dictator. He's a, yet Jesus said, You can be my friend if you'll do everything I tell you to do. Isn't that amazing? All right. If you love me, keep my commandments. Look at verse 21. He said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Notice verse 23 and 24. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now I want you to notice something that a lot of people are not seeing there. We're, we're awful free with this God is love business and we're awful uh, free with the bumper stickers that says smile, God loves you and all that. But would you notice that there is a little condition here. He says, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him. Now see, we're not telling the other part of this. And I'm not going to get off on this, but do you know that there are people whom God hates? Now, I'm not going to go off on that because that's not my message this morning. But he says this. He that loveth, verse 24, He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. Now, I don't care how much we shout. I don't care how much we talk in tongues. I don't care how many gifts of the Spirit we say we have. If we are not doing what God said to do in His Word according to Jesus, we don't love Him. Amen. All right. He said, He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Now, I want you to go to the 31st verse, and I want you to see that Jesus practiced what he preached. He said, But that the world may know. In other words, he says, Look, I don't expect you to believe me just because I say it. I don't expect you to just take my word that I love my Father. He says, But that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. How do you know if somebody loves God? They do what God says. It's that simple. And Jesus said, hey, look, I'm no exception. I love the Father. I want you to believe that. I hope you believe that. But in order to prove that I love the Father, I am going to do what he told me to do. And that's what, it's, that's what holiness is all about. What is holiness? All right, let's go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and let's talk about what holiness is. It's interesting. 1 Peter chapter 1 beginning with verse 12. And we read, Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into. Now I want you to see this. Wherefore, because of this, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end. It's not all over with. Did you know that? The race hasn't been won yet. It's not all finished yet. No. Peter says, hey, hang in there. 
That's some more Greek that you got to get there. Uh, hang in there. Stay in there until the race is completed. Don't quit now. But he said, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now listen, listen to verse 14. As obedient children. We come back to this again. Peter's saying the same thing that Jesus said. Listen, if you really love me, if you're really saved, if you're really living for God, you must be obedient. As obedient children. Now here's something we have to do. Not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. Do you see right there, there has to be a change after you're saved. There's got to be a change. Being saved, living a life of holiness requires a definite about face, requires a definite change. He says, don't be like you used to be. Don't do it. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be you holy. Now, if all we had to do to be holy was be saved, if when I got saved, I was automatically endued with all of the holiness that God wanted me to have, this would be a dumb statement. Peter said, look, if you're really going to please God, and because of the things that are coming on the world, I want to leave a commandment with you, you be holy. Now, if there was nothing that I could do to be holy, that would be crazy. But there is something that I must do to be holy. And so Peter says, be ye holy. As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And you know and I know that that word conversation means our behavior. Our daily walk. The way we live. The way we walk. Not just the way we talk, but every part of our life, Peter says, be holy in all of your behavior. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Go with me to 2 Peter. What is holiness? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away, with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now, Peter says, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy behavior, all holy conversation, and godliness? Peter says, because the end is coming, because Christ is coming, because judgment is coming, because the world is going to be destroyed. How should you live? He said, What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy behavior and godliness looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, in other words, because of this, beloved, Seeing that you are looking for such things, be diligent. So you see, he, they're coming back and they're saying again, Hey, you have to do something. You have to make an effort if you're going to go to heaven. You have to make an effort if you're going to make the rapture. You are going to have to do something in your life, in your conversation, in your behavior, if you are going to see God. And he says, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things, before, beware, lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. And my friend, there is a tremendous pressure today to lead us away from Bible standards of holiness. There uh, is an insistence, there is an incessant, unrelenting pressure that keeps saying, hey, it really doesn't make any difference what you are on the outside. And Peter said, look, he said, you know these things. 
I've written to you about these things. Christ has spoken about these things. Paul has spoken about these things. He says, beloved brethren, listen, you know this. He said, be careful lest you be led away with the error of the wicked. My friend, anyone who tries to get you to compromise Bible standards is wicked. I don't care how nice they are. I don't care how sweet they are. I don't care how glorious a personality they have. They are wicked. One of our teenage girls just uh, this last summer went on a trip with her mother. This girl is about 15 years old. A beautiful, beautiful young lady. And by the way, the prettiest girls in all the world are holiness girls. Boy, you girls missed a really neat opportunity to holler amen on that beautiful girl and she's out with her grandmother and her grandmother says hey let's get your hair cut she says no she says I don't believe in that she said uh, I'll take care of it with your mother don't worry about it now my friend listen any time you see something like this happening what most people are are, are so wishy-washy about the thing that really tore me up was the spirit behind this I know your mother doesn't want you to, but you do it anyway, and I'll run interference for you, and I'll make it all right. Brother, sister, that is just plain old rebellion. And a lot of these people that are trying to get you to compromise, if you'll just look into it a little deeper than the surface, surface, you will see a real rebellious spirit within these people that are trying to get you to compromise. And one of the reasons is they feel uncomfortable around you because you have more than what they have. All right, so he says... Don't fall from your own steadfastness. And oh, I, I, I want to say this this morning. Don't feel that you're alone. Don't feel that holiness is going out of style. We, we are working with some real um, liberal uh, full gospel churches in our area. And recently one of the pastors shocked me by saying to a man who came to me and told me, he said, listen, he says, before this thing is all finished, we're all going to have to believe like Brother Hill believes or we'll be destroyed. That's true, Brother Collins. Listen, this is not the time to cave in. This is not the time to give up. We are so close to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that this is the time, my friend, that we need to renew our efforts, uh, re-strengthen our convictions and our standards, pray through and say, hey, I refuse to give an inch. I am going forward with the Lord. What a terrible time to compromise a few days or weeks or months before Jesus comes. And so he says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory now and forever. Amen. All right. What is holiness? Do you, do you see a picture with me? Every time he talks about righteousness, every time he talks about holiness, he says, do something. Get on the ball. Be diligent. Beware. Fear lest you fall from it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Go with me. Please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, a scripture that many of you are familiar with. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 14, where he says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, or because of this, come out from among them and be separate. Oh, we hate to be different, don't we? Oh, we just hate to be separate, don't we? Hallelujah. Just, oh, with so many people. They don't mind being holiness if everybody else would be holiness. They don't mind looking like they look if just everybody else would look like that. Oh, we just hate to be different. It, we just don't want to stand out. I, I laughed a, a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, when the girls started wearing these clogs and all these wild shoes. And, and I can remember just a few years back, some of the girls saw, uh, some of my girls in my church saw the pictures of the old grandmas in some of these shoes. And they said, Ugh, I'd die before I'd wear a pair of those. Next thing you know, they're in the catalogs. They're in the advertisements. And they all ran out and bought a pair. 
<laughs> Death came so easy. <laughs> you know, it, I, I'm not saying they're wrong. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying they're wrong. I think some of them are neat. They're certainly wild. I mean, they're intriguing to look at. <laughs> I mean, some of the heels look like they came right off of a Viking ship. You know, I'm not saying they're wrong. Please don't get me wrong. If I'm going to rail at something, I'm going to rail at something the Bible says is wrong, okay? I'm just saying that we don't mind being different if everybody else will be different with us. Hallelujah. All right. So he says, be separate. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, let's go on, because there's no division in the original manuscript. So, so Paul says, having therefore these promises. What does he say? He says, because we have these promises, dearly beloved. What promise? That God will be our father and we'll be our, his children. That God will live in us, that God will walk in us, that, that uh, he is going to be close to us. We're going to be special to him and he's going to be special to us. Because we have these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Now, I'm talking about after salvation, you remember. You can't cleanse yourself to get saved. You have to go on the sheer grace of God. You've got to go and just throw yourself at His mercy, and He forgives you for your past sins. And after you're saved begins the process of self-cleansing where we get into the place where we clean up our act. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. What is holiness? Right there. That's, that's, that's a tremendous part of holiness is cleaning up your own life. Let, listen to him. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. How do you get holy? You cleanse yourself. You quit doing some things that you ought not to be doing. You start doing some things that you haven't been doing that you should have been doing. My friend, it cannot be much plainer or much clearer than it is right here. You cannot be holy. You cannot perfect holiness unless you begin to examine your own life and get rid of those things that God says are wrong. Isn't that simple? Why is there all the question about holiness? It just baffles me. People say, you know, I heard one fellow say that he went to a, a, one of the top universities in, uh, in uh, England and they studied philosophy and for one whole semester they debated whether the podium that the speaker was standing behind was really there or it was a figment of their imagination. I says, well, what conclusion did they come to? He says, they couldn't decide. That's education. I mean, that's going the, the wild side. But why is it so complicated? Why is it so hard? And people say, well, what is holiness? The Bible plainly tells us what holiness is. It is cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. And notice he says flesh first. And so don't listen to those that say, well, holiness is of the spirit. And, and, uh, and it's just an inside thing. And that's all there is to it. And Please turn the tape over. At and if you got it on the inside, that's all that you need. My friend, that's not true. Let me show you that. Let's, let's go back to first, uh, uh, first Peter chapter 3. Let's look at this. Oh, you'll like this. <laughs> I just know you will. First Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Most of the men think that's the golden text of the Bible. I can preach an hour on the family and all the husbands will go home and say, did you hear what he said? You're supposed to obey me. And the wife says, did you hear what else he said? And he says, did he say something else? <laughs> you know what I say, don't you? Christians have more fun accidentally than sinners do on purpose. We were just in California and had an accident with our bus on Interstate 5 between Bakersfield and Los Angeles, five lanes wide on one side. A dual wheel rolled off, it's fog. We caused a seven car pile up. They ended up having to close Interstate 5 for the Calvary Singers. Talk about humiliation. And some character was there. And he said, what is that you say about Christians having more fun accidentally 
seven cars piled up and he reminds me of that it's funny now but it wasn't funny then God sent us a spirit filled patrolman the only one on that force in that part the rest of them are Mormons and he's up there praising God he said hallelujah nobody got hurt I looked at him I said but what about all these cars he said it's a piece of cake he said he said we had 70 of them pile up here it's on a mountain he said we had 70 of them pile up here but it didn't even give us a ticket said go you know of course we couldn't go but um. <laughs> let me tell you something my friend it is exciting <laughs> it is exciting living the Christian life don't let some Twinkie tell you it's not fun. It's fun to live for God. It's fun to be holiness. It's fun to be what God wants you to be. The only thing wrong with the rest of them is that they're jealous. <laughs> we sang at an extremely liberal Pentecostal church a few weeks ago. And the people came up and they said, We've never had anything like this. They said, this is great. My wife and I were lying in bed that night and she said, what made us different? They're Pentecostal. Other groups have had the anointing. And I said, don't you know? And she says, no. I said, it's holiness. Do you know the very thing that pastors are telling people that they shouldn't pay any attention to is what they, down in their heart, that desire that God put there, they really do want it. They don't know it. And they may refuse it first off, but down in their heart, they secretly, their innermost being wants holiness. Amen. That's true. I'm telling you, it's fun living for God in, in, in these last days. What an opportunity to be different. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold and putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in sight of God of great price now somebody says listen God don't care how you dress God doesn't care how your hair is God looks on the inside man looks on the outside will you put your thumb in 1st Peter chapter 3 in just a minute and go back with me to 1st Samuel chapter 16 1 Samuel chapter 16, and I want you to see something. We will, we will start to read at verse 6. And this is the account of when Samuel came to anoint the successor to Saul. And this is one of the most misquoted scriptures, dragged out of its context and used violently. And listen to it. And it came to pass when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for a man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now so many people quote this to say that it doesn't make any difference if you dress him modestly or wear makeup or drag yourself down with jewelry. God doesn't look on the outward appearance. He looks on the heart. Now, that's not what this scripture is talking about. Israel had just had a king who was head and shoulders above everybody else. And they said, what a man. Wow, he's a champion. And so here comes another big, tall brute of a guy, and Samuel hasn't learned his lesson yet. He said, oh, this must be the one. And God said, hey, wait a minute. Don't look on his countenance. Don't look on the height of his stature. Don't look on this big guy. You just had a big guy and he about ruined you. He said, I'm looking at the heart. I want that little short, pudgy, freckle-faced kid with pimples. That's nothing to do with dress or makeup or jewelry or hair or anything like that absolutely completely divorced from anything of that he's talking about how tall and how how strong and how handsome he was amen all right if if god doesn't look on the outward appearance why does he say that it's an abomination to him for a woman to wear man's apparel 
and for a man to wear women's apparel. Why is it an abomination if God doesn't look on the outward? He must look on the outward. You see, this is completely twisted out of its, out of its place. Amen. Hallelujah. I, I'm tempted. Uh, I'm tempted. I can resist anything but temptation. I'm not going to go into a big thing on this, but, but you pastors know that try to keep a standard. I had a, I had a lady, a Methodist pastor's wife, come into my living room just a few weeks ago, and she said, you're unfair to the women. And I said, why? And she says, you won't let them wear slacks. I says, I'm just as fair to them as I am to the men. She says, how do you figure? I says, I don't let the men wear dresses. <laughs> right. Listen, I don't care how many people do it. It all started when the women started working in the defense plants during the war. And I don't care if they have put on buttons on the side instead of zippers on the front. Or on the back. They're still pants. And I said last time I was here, and I'll say it again, that if I was to come and wear a dress, and most dresses button or zipper down the front, the back, or the side, but I had a new invention that zippered around the waist, and I'd say it's a man's dress. By the way, the police picked up a man in a dress in our town not too long ago. high heel shoes, nylon hose. What are y'all going for? That's all right. It's just as all right as it is for you to wear slacks. It's not a bit of difference. You say, Brother Hill, uh, talk about something spiritual. I just did and you didn't catch it. I mean, if you can't get the ABCs, how are you going to go on to college? Somebody said, but that's just a little thing. Well, take care of it. If it's a little thing, it's, it's like that. It's easier to take care of. But you know and I know, Brother Collins, that the hardest thing in the world is to get women to quit wearing slacks. And I'll tell you why. And that's because of the unisex spirit that is trying to destroy our nation. The same spirit that's pushing the parades by thousands of homosexuals and lesbians that march down the streets brazenly and openly. The same spirit. I didn't say that ladies that did I know some very nice ladies that wear slacks they're very fine very fine but it's the same spirit pushing it are you still with me I'm not going to ask you if I alienated anybody now but people I marvel I marvel listen somebody says that's Old Testament no it's New Testament too yeah he says in 1 Corinthians, he says, the effeminate and the abusers of themselves with mankind will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. You go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, God still hates anything which destroys the distinction between the sexes. He says it's a shame for a man to have long hair and a woman ought not to cut hers. And somebody says that was written to the Greeks. So was that communion scripture right after that that so many of us quote when we have communion that Paul wrote in the same chapter. Let's throw it out too. Oh, right before that he says he gives us the chain of command that we all love. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. Let's throw that out too. That was written to the Greeks. Let's throw it all out. Actually, none of it was written to you personally. I mean, if you're on an ego trip, come down. Amen. You're really listening in on somebody else's conversation. Hallelujah. Well, <clears throat> hallelujah. So don't ever, don't ever, don't ever be so, so uh, naive. I started to say dumb and that sounded bad. Uh, don't ever be so naive as to say, well, God looks on the inside. Man looks on the outside. That's a good enough reason to take care of the outside. Because that's what man sees. Amen. I'll not get off onto that, but it's interesting. <laughs> uh, he said, listen, he said, in, 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 let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 3. By the way, if God doesn't look on the outward appearance, how come he gets after those Israelites in, in Isaiah? And he says, you know, he said, I hate those 
those uh, earrings, those nose jewels. That's it's going to be, you know. One of one of the top gospel singers, you know, one of the men is wearing an earring now in one ear. I'm not going to name names because that happens to be against my policy <clears throat> most of the time. Once in a while I weaken. Would you like for me to weaken? I won't do it. <laughs> I'm tempted, but I'm not going to yield this time. <laughs> Now listen, we're in 1 Peter chapter 3. Don't get me off the track again like that. He said, for after this manner, in the old time... Now, let me, let me tell you something. Somebody comes along and says, well, you know, all this standards, this is, you're keeping your people under law. Hey, this is all New Testament. I don't find any place in the Old Testament where it said it's a shame for a man to have long hair. That's New Testament. I don't find any place in the Old Testament where he says women should dress modestly. They did. But I don't find it in the Old Testament. This is New Testament grace under that great apostle of grace, the Apostle Paul. Yes. Now, notice, he says, here Peter says, for after this manner in the Old Time, the Old Testament, the holy women. Now, wait a minute. Do you see something that I see? What is holiness? Paul says, hey, mind your husbands. Uh, be careful how you dress. Be careful how you fix your hair. Because in the old time, the holy women. Now, if you don't want to be a holy woman, this doesn't apply to you. But if you want to be a holy woman and go to heaven, you better listen. Is that pretty simple? I mean, Brother Dutka says, that my messages are simple. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it just isn't complicated, is it? The holy women did this. Being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. I've had a hard time getting my wife to call me Lord. <laughs> she finally said, would sir do? And I settled for that. This is holiness. What is holiness? Right here. Right here. Let, let's go. Let's look at this. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Oh, I'm, I'm having fun. I don't know if you're having fun, but I'm enjoying this. I, uh, oh, hallelujah. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8. He said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner. Like manner to what? Like manner to men that are holy. Women also, uh, also the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. I saw my first miniskirt in years, Monday morning, two days ago in Los Angeles. I couldn't believe it. I said, oh no, Lord. We done fought this battle once. I, I couldn't believe it. I said, oh, it can't be. They're not going to do this to us again. Oh, we had a battle. You know what I'm talking about. You pastors, we had a battle. <laughs> he says, adorn yourselves in modest apparel. That means anything, and I don't have the time to go into it, but it must, absolutely must cover the thigh. And you know, a skirt with a split in it is only as long as the split. That's right. And what really amazes me is the Pentecostal people who can go to the beach and take off almost everything. <laughs> and evidently what Paul meant here was in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel except when you get close to water and sand. Now look at this. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair. Do you know what that is? They, they weaved or wove or woved or woved, however that is, whatever that is, jewels in their hair. I, I guess maybe I'm a little strict. 
just a shade. It bothers me. It seems like people try to get as close as they can. Our, our girls in our church about a year or two ago started showing up with little, little teeny weensy crosses around their neck. Yeah. I wanted to, you know. And I said to myself, look, you're a fanatic. That shouldn't bother you. That's just a little thing. I've been hearing it. I've been hearing it. And you know, it wasn't me. It was my spirit inside me was grieved when the Holy Spirit moved upon my spirit. I was grieved and I couldn't contain myself any longer. And I said, get them off. Get them off. They had told their mothers that I said they were all right. Yeah. One fellow stood up and testified, as like Brother Hill said, it's all right to work on Sunday as long as you go to church first. I said, I didn't say that. One lady stood up shortly after and said, it's like Brother Hill says, as long as you watch the good programs on television. I said, sister, I didn't say that. I don't have a television set. Got rid of mine 25, 6, 7 years ago. Wouldn't have one of those devilish things in my house. I don't care and I don't need to watch. That fellow's wife who has the trouble with paint, who used to be holiness. I won't mention her name. In like, in like manner also that y'all don't really think that you're getting fed when you watch that garbage, do you? That is an insult. Vance Havener said, in order for me to fellowship with most Christians, I'd have to backslide. Listen, I had a lady just recently get saved in my church right out of the Lutheran church and she is a Mary Kay Cosmetics salesperson. And she saw this man's wife on the LTP or whatever that is on the television and she said, Brother Hill, that girl has a problem. And I was amazed. She just got saved. She didn't know anything yet. And I says, what do you mean? She says, all that paint she puts on. She said, I'm a cosmetic sales girl. And she said, that girl is trying to cover up something. You don't need it. I mean to tell you when you've got the glow of God on your face and you've got that sweet disposition of, an, uh, of a meek and a quiet spirit that Peter said the holy women in the Old Testament had, you don't need all that garbage. Hallelujah. I'll tell you, we had a girl come to our church and get saved, and she had black eyes. I don't mean eyeballs, I mean sockets. And she cried, and she cried, and she got up from the altar, and I laughed, and I laughed. She had black stripes, twin stripes on her face. And she went home, and her dad said, Honey, if you're going to go to that church, you better leave that stuff off. And he didn't even know about our standards. But he said, If they make you cry there, you better leave that stuff off. I think that's good advice from a sinner. Uh, in like manner. <clears throat> Also, uh, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness. Do you know what that word shamefacedness means? It actually means without paint. That's right. Shamefacedness, it means a very humble appearance because the paint is to call attention. That's true. Somebody says, well, Brother Hill, just a little bit. Well, if you just need a little bit, leave it off. You're not in that bad of shape. Leave it off. You'll be happier. You will never be, listen, you will never be as happy as you are when you know you're in obedience to this word. And my friend, you will not go to heaven unless you obey this word. Now he says, uh, 
not with broided hair, I told you what that was, or gold, or pearls, or costly array. Now look, but which becometh women professing godliness. Isn't that neat? What is holiness? What is godliness? What I just read. Simple, isn't it? Why do we have all this fuss over it? Why do we have all this trouble understanding it? People read 1 Corinthians 11 and say, I wonder what that means. <laughs> it's a shame for a man to have long hair. I wonder what he meant by that. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> he said all of these things. He said, which becometh women professing godliness. Ladies and gentlemen, who are you trying to please? All of your problems of confusion and obedience and understanding the word of God will be over when you try to please the Heavenly Father. But as long as you're trying to be saved and please the world, you will be torn to shreds with indecision and confusion. Go back with me to Hebrews chapter 12, and I'll close on this, I think. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. I want you to see this. This is beautiful. He said, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down. And it means to set upright again, to reestablish or to... Get straightened out again. That's what Paul is talking about. Or, excuse me, the writer of Hebrews is talking about. That's what he's talking about in, in here. He says, get it straightened. And he says, and the feeble knees. He's talking about worn persons, sick persons who are discouraged, who are feeble spiritually because they have become confused and so he says, lift up the hands that hang down and the feeble knees. He said, in other words, take courage and persevere to the end. And then he says, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Listen, he is saying, lest you get into rough and stony ways and become lame and be prevented from reaching the goals, get everything straightened out. That's what he's saying. And notice what he said. If you go into the proper path, though you have been wounded in a wrong path, your wound will be healed if you get back in the right path. Notice that's what he said. Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. And so he's saying, even if you've gotten off onto a wrong path and gotten wounded, get back on the right path and you'll be healed. Isn't that marvelous? My friend, holiness is important. What is holiness? It's doing these things and more that I haven't mentioned. That God tells us to do. So when someone comes to you and tries to give you a, a, a far out definition of holiness. Remember these scriptures and read them again and again until they become a part of your very life. And you'll never be confused again. I promise you, if you'll stay in this word, you will never become confused again as to what holiness is. Someone said to me a long time ago, Brother Hill, if people are willing to compromise what you can see on the outside, what are they doing on the inside where you can't look? Praise the Lord. Are you asleep? I said, Praise the Lord. Well, I just wanted you to listen, not that you do not know a lot of these things, 
but I want you to just reflect and think through that an American preacher preaching to American congregation maintaining such standards in a church in America is more difficult than you in Nigeria trying to maintain the standard. The pressure is greater over there where every family possesses television and everybody, all women, almost wear makeup, have jewelry. For a pastor to still remain on such a standard, no makeup, no jewelry, no slacks, uh, women not cutting their hair, men not wearing long hair, and still emphasizing the fact that he doesn't have television and his family does not have and his church members do not have. And it's not just a church in a corner, by the way. It's a church that is known. It will be, if we think that, you know, we are kind of isolated, the pressure is so much upon us, we have to have this, we have to have this, uh, we're too different from other people. Think about the pressure that will come on such people. And I think that should be an encouragement to us. Not only an encouragement, a challenge. Not only a challenge, it should even be a shame for us if we are complaining that the thing is too high for us here. When holiness preachers in the present day, uh, they are still maintaining the same standard. When we eventually get over there, if we do not maintain the standard, where the pressure is not as much, uh, those people that are facing greater terrible pressure, a uh, more terrible pressure, it uh, will be a judge because um, the judgment uh, will come upon us not only from the word of God and not only from the Lord, but from such people that live in the same generation in more difficult places and they're able to maintain the standard. So I want to remind you once again, we preached here last Sunday here, Follow peace with all men. And, <laughs> tell me out loud, without which no man shall see the Lord. The standard is...